We're here today on behalf of the Hamilton College Jazz Archives. My name is Monk Rowe. This is Michael Woods. And today we have one of the best known trombone players in jazz. Mr. Irby Green is with us to talk about his experiences in jazz. Welcome. Nice to be here. Thank it's you. It's a nice setting. We're on the Royal Caribbean. And uh, Irby will be playing a set tonight. And uh, I'd like to start off. Uh, we've had some really interesting talk about how people got started in the music business. Some, some of players happened to fall into circumstances that changed their whole lives. Some people kind of had to work for years and years before they found their niche. I wonder if you'd like to talk about that. Well, just that part's a long story. Uh, uh, let me think how I can cut it short. <laughs> Let's see uh, how I got into music. Yeah. Uh, well, I was one of five children, and uh, we had a mother that played the piano a little bit. And so she started each one of us with the basics of uh, playing the piano. And uh, my uh, brother Al was about, let's see, I, I started when I was about five, I guess. Five, but we all started about that same age. And my brother Al, who was the second child in the family, uh, was the first one that really got into the professional category of music. And uh, about let's see, in the mid-30s, I can't rem remember exactly what year it was, uh, we, we grew up in Mobile, Alabama. And uh, that was right in the middle of the de Depression, the Great Depression. And uh, things weren't so hot down there. I mean, uh, financially, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty hot otherwise. <laughs> uh, we all we decided to go to California, so we drove out to California, all the kids and, and my mother, although my father and oldest brother stayed back in Mobile until we got settled out there. And, uh, and uh, we, I remember we drove, made the trip in a Model A Ford, and uh, all through Route 90, all the way through Louisiana, Texas, and Arizona, New Mexico. And, and uh, we found a house to rent right in the middle of Hollywood. And my older, my brother Al was about 16 or 17. Uh, went to Hollywood High School, which was about three blocks away from where we lived. And he played piano in a little jazz band and with the school kids there. And, uh, and his best friend in that band uh, was uh, Earl Hagen. I don't, do you know the name of Earl yes. Hagen? And he was uh, played trombone. Mm -hmm. and, uh, later became one of the big Hollywood writers, writers and, yeah. and composers. I guess everybody knows his song, Harlem Nocturne, that yeah. became like a real standard. And uh, so my brother got interested in the trombone from Earl, and he bought his old trombone from him. I think it was $2 or something like that, a beat up old horn. Yeah. And that horn went down to my brother Jack. Well, well, first of all, after a year in Hollywood, we went back to Mobile oh. and took that trombone with us. and. Uh, my, uh, see, when my brother Jack was about 12, he took up that trombone and got a new one, like throwing papers or something like that, paper route. And uh, he gave me the old one, and uh, that was when I was 12. And that's how the trombone came into the yeah. family. And I played all through high school and started playing with local professional guys around town, I guess, when I was about 15. And, uh, is that enough of how I got into sure. it, or this, sure. it goes a long ways from there? Yeah, there. I know. We'll get to that. <laughs> okay. So you had a basically a high school education as far as your mm -hmm. trombone, and then and the piano I, training we had earlier was a real good introduction to music because we yeah. my uh, my mother taught us all how to read music. She didn't know a lot about it herself. She knew just like the basic value of the notes, a quarter note gets a beat, and mm -hmm. uh, a few things like that. And but she made us practice. I'll see an hour a day in the winter time, two hours a day in the summertime. Right. What do you consider to be your first break in the business? Well, it might have been when World War II broke out. The, uh, all the good guys went to the army, so uh, they had to hire us kids to play. You know? I'll be darned. <laughs> that was about the way I really got into it, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, playing around Mobile for a couple of years, I think it was about 
16, uh, <clears throat> there was a band from Auburn, Alabama. It was known as the Auburn Knights, a college band. They were a very good big band, and they had, were playing a, a date in Mobile. And they came up to this place called the Airport Restaurant, where I was playing with a little band. And they heard me play and uh, offered me a chance to go up to Auburn and play with their band, although I was still in high school. So oh. when I moved up there and played, I guess, one semester, uh, and went to Auburn High School. And that summer, they had a summer job at Virginia Beach. No, it was usually Virginia Beach, but that year it was Wrightsville Beach, uh, South Carolina, or North mm -hmm. Carolina, I guess it was. So we went up there, and. Uh, a big band came through there that was looking for a trombone player, and so this was in the summertime. Uh, a band by the name of Tommy Reynolds, yes. and uh, he was from New York. He was one of the up-and-coming new bands, and they were going into uh, uh, the Lincoln Hotel in New York, I think. But I couldn't stay because I had to go back and finish my finish. high school. So, but anyway, I met a lot of guys that. I, I ran into later on in life. One of them, in particular, a fellow named Al Ramsey, he was a trumpet player who, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I went back to Mobile and I didn't stay in high school. I dropped out because another band came through town and I was going to New York. So I figured I'd finish my school later on. So he was going to Roseland Ballroom. Mm -hmm. So that was my first trip to New York. That, was, that band was uh, Bob Strong, a, a band from Chicago. And it was their big break going to New York playing Roseland and getting coast to coast broadcast every night. And so I joined uh, that band and stayed a few months. And this Al Ramsey fellow, meanwhile, had gone with another band, uh, Frankie Carl's Orchestra, and he recommended me f to go from Bob Strong, and I went to Frankie Carl. No, that was, I forgot, I left out a year. <laughs> it was, uh, after Bob Strong, I went with Jan, Jan Sabbath's orchestra, who was kind of a pretty well-named name band of their 40s. And uh, it was kind of important, that band, because we were going to California, and we stayed there for about eight weeks, which gave me time to finish my high school uh, education. Wow. We, I, there was a school close by called the Hollywood Professional School that a lot of... Uh, kids that were in movies and things went mm -hmm. to. So while I was playing out in Southgate, California at the Trianon Ballroom, uh, I went to high school in the daytime, finished my, wow. got my diploma from the Hollywood Professional School. And, uh, By this time, was music your career? I mean, you, you said, okay, I'm gonna be a musician mm -hmm. now. This is something I can do. I, I suppose so. Uh, I, uh, you were, I think you were talking to Houston person earlier about if you just fall into it or what. Right. I think I, I actually kind of just fell into it because uh, the older brothers kind of led the way, mm -hmm. you know, and the trombone was there, and you might as well play it. It's there, yeah. you know. Right. And uh, let's see. I don't know. I could take up the whole story before I get to be uh, 18 years old, I guess. Yeah. But. Well, <laughs> we've got some specific um, questions to ask about some of the. Uh, the big groups later on that you played with, and were you were you influenced by recordings? Oh yeah, as, as like a, it was like during the big band era, I guess the late '30s and early '40s, and uh, and we always heard uh, the big bands. You know, like Tommy Dorsey was a good example of how the trombone ought to sound. I guess he mm -hmm. was very popular, and uh, along with. Uh, Benny Goodman and uh, Count Basie, and Duke Ellington. Mm -hmm. Trummy Young was a, we, I remember that was one of the solos I used to practice uh, on his solo on Margie when I was still in high school. We used to, with the Jimmy Lunsford band. Mm -hmm. and he sang a chorus and then played a chorus. And I think I never heard anybody hit a high F sharp before that. <laughs> Did you ever have an occasion to uh, play with Basie in any context? Well, uh, in the recording studios, mm -hmm. uh, he would come to New York to make records, and uh, he normally only carried three trombones with him, so uh, they would add me onto the band and oh. to fill out the section, and ended up getting cut a few solos down on record yeah. with Basie, and 
I think I had about four albums, and then Ella Fitzgerald came in and, and with and recorded with the Basie Band, and so they had a trombone on that, and uh, Sammy Davis Jr. I like the recording studios uh, got me into a lot of different situations, you know. Yeah. A lot of people come through New York and add me onto the band. And I wanted to ask you about your uh, uh, work with the Basie Band. Can you tell us about the sound? or the feel of that rhythm section? Because everybody says they like that rhythm section. That was the rhythm section, big band, the, the big band rhythm yeah, section. Yeah, well, that's, uh, anytime I ever do high school and college clinics, I always tell them to listen to that Basie band. Well, the whole band, but particularly the rhythm section. And uh, it's just a, an example of the way it's supposed to go, you know, I mean, in that type of music anyway. Uh, and uh, I remember we, during the period that I played with him, uh, we were normally recording at the A and R studio on 48th Street, which was a very small room, uh, probably about half as big as this room, and wow. the whole band in there, and uh, and and the time was so precise, you know. And, uh, and uh, I had let, just left. I mean, before I went to New York to do a lot of studio, uh, studio work, I had played with Woody Herman and Gene Krupa's bands for. Well, Gene for about four years and Woody for three years. And uh, and although er those bands all admired the Basie and Ellington bands very much, uh, it was just a little different. Uh, sometimes uh, I always noticed that the, the Basie band didn't re really play as loud as you think they're playing either. You know, like we would get up on with Woody and we'd blast yes. away all night and blow the walls down, we thought. But sometimes if you play a little softer it sounds bigger you know than if you uh. like, the louder you play the thinner it gets mm -hmm. uh, but that this settled back a little bit and it kind of opens up a real wide warm sound it's, it was really kind of that concept like we ain't really working or this ain't hard yeah <laughs> but, but it sounds bigger than when you're blasting away you know? yeah and a lot of it has to do with the balance too uh -huh. uh, being able to hear everything you know, I'm sure when a band is wailing away, at top, the piano disappears and certain other parts of the music. Well, basically, could always find those holes anyway, though. Yeah. <laughs> Even, he chooses moments, yeah. wouldn't he? Well, I think the bassy band did leave a lot of open spots. So, uh, generally, did you know. Did Freddie Green play unamplified? Yeah, I think he might I had a microphone in front of him. I'm not, oh. not even sure. I mean, it wasn't a pickup, electric pickup. Uh -huh. you know? It wasn't that kind of an amplification where it's attached to the guitar. Yeah. Uh huh. But I, I'm, I think that you probably, well, everybody had a microphone in the recording studio. Although in the earlier days, sometimes they did all those records with one microphone, I guess. Wow. Like the, the, that means they had to be balanced. Yeah. Like the Carnegie Hall jazz uh, thing that Benny Goodman did, I think, with just one microphone. So they balanced themselves. And over the years, it's gotten so everybody it's very isolated in the studio now. You've got your own microphone and your own earphones. And <laughs> so the whole balance is up to the engineer, whereas uh, uh, getting a balance within yourselves is not all that important anymore or critical. I wanted to ask you about your, your personal style of, of playing the trombone. Uh, who, when you were coming up, who did you listen to? Who did you think was the voice on trombone? And uh, as, as Monk has referred to, when did you decide that you had a voice? Well, uh, I think you strive to find your own feelings and emotional contact with the music, you know, so that'll make it individual no matter who you are. You know, if you really do what's true to yourself, you know, that's about as good as you can get, I guess. Well, of course, with all the other influences getting you ready for it, you know, in the meantime. But the early voices, uh, I guess, uh, Trummy Young and uh, so, uh, Jack Jenny. I never heard a lot of him, but he, he had that solo that was played all around on Artie Shaw's record of Stardust, which opened up with Billy Butterfield on trumpet, who was another one of my favorite players. And Artie Shaw and clarinet. 
Uh, in fact, that whole record was a good exercise. He like, starts off with the trumpet and goes into the clarinet and the trombone. In fact, my brother Jack and I used to, we wrote, wrote that all out when we were kids and practiced oh. that thing. So there's a little Jack Jenny and B Billy Butterfield and Artie Shaw in this too, I guess. And uh, Lawrence Brown was one of my favorite players too. He was with Ellington, wasn't mm -hmm. he? Yeah. He was very individual sounding. You could recognize him right away. That was the trademark of the Ellington band almost, is that he wrote for certain people, not mm. just the second alto player, you know. The guy had to, he wrote for the individual, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of those ballads, I guess he wrote for Johnny Hodges. Uh, later on, people put lyrics to him and they became pop songs. They don't get around much anymore. Mm -hmm. Actually, the melody of that was a little different when he first wrote it. But oh, yeah? I guess they changed it around. Oh. Let's see. That's the way it did. But right toward the end there, there was something different on that original. I can't remember what it was, but because it wasn't played too much after it became a pop song. <laughs> so. You did some pretty extensive studio work over the years, was that mostly in New mm -hmm. York? Yeah, after 11 years of traveling around with bands, yeah. I, I finally settled down in New York. Uh -huh. can, you, uh, can you tell us about, was there any studio things that you remember that border out on ridiculous? Or, or anything that was funny, <laughs> or, or, or just little quirky things about jazz? Uh, quirky, yes sir. When we, when I listen to uh, music behind some commercials these days, I'm thinking, you know, people had to actually play this, and someone <laughs> sat down and wrote this thing, you know, and I'm wondering sometimes how, how some of the players uh, keep a straight face. Yeah. Well, in the studio, sometimes you get in a situation where you kind of have to be an actor, like you're not really playing yourself, you know, like what you'd really choose. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm talking about musical act. Yeah. <laughs> like a... They'd say, well, play this like Tommy Dorsey, or, you know, and so you try to play, there's only one Tommy Dorsey, but you, so you do something similar to that. And, uh, or uh, Jack T. Gordon, and I want this, or, well, one time I had, to, I had to imitate a dog eating dog food with so my plunger. <laughs> 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 but uh, I guess that's really a... Uh, 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 what's, I can't think of it. I got, I got a, a small vocabulary. <laughs> Never went to no college, you know. <laughs> well, we've had some interesting, you know, talk about what people learn in college and as, as opposed to what happens out in the real mm -hmm. world, you know. And, and nowadays, I know you've done work in colleges with, with the music programs. Mm -hmm. And what happens after they get out of school? Have, have you ever talked to to students after they got out and have any insight into, you know? Well, this young fellow that's playing with us tonight, Chris Potter, are you familiar with him yes, at all? Yes, I've heard his name. Just an amazing frequently. young player. And my, my son, Jesse, they're both about the same age, about 23 now, I think. And, uh, and boy, he, he knows more about jazz history than I do, and he, but, he, but he goes right from the beginning to what's happening now, and hmm. somewhere in there, is Chris, his own thing is coming out too, you know. Yeah, if you haven't heard him, it'd be interesting to hear him. Well, there's an example. He, uh, well, he went right to New York, I guess, uh, got a, a scholarship to the new school there, and he stayed there for a while, then he went to the Manhattan School of Music, which I think he's still involved there. And uh, he's, as soon as he got to New York, uh, Red Rodney started using him with his group, mm -hmm. so he traveled a lot around with Red. And, uh, well, there's one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, asking about what's happened to, happened to the young fellows. You know. it's, it's unfortunate that the opportunities, as far as the big band playing, and you know, are not mm -hmm. nearly as plentiful as they used to be. I, I think there's probably a lot more talented people out there. They come out of schools and mm -hmm. they they're scrambling for 
ways to uh, show what they know and then to go to the next level. Well, uh, I, I think of this uh, band out in uh, Santa Monica, California. It was started by Ernest Clark, I think. Trumpet virtuoso back in 1902, I think it was. He started this municipal band out there, about 35 pieces. And within that band, they had a regular big, big jazz band, and then small combos and chamber groups. And it was all, and they're all on salary out there and had their own recording studio. But anyway, it started from uh, 1902, and as far as I know, it's still going today. And uh, they bring in guest artists out there to either play or sing, whatever they do, and they back them up. And it seems like a lot of cities could do something like that rather than only thinking of a symphony orchestra. They could probably have uh, something. I think that was 35 people involved, and they had a big band, and little Dixieland bands or whatever they in could a, in use. In other words, like repertory orchestras mm -hmm. for to perpetuate jazz. Because and, if you go to any major city in the United States of America, there's a symphony there that can mm -hmm. play all the European classics. Right. And uh, this thing was financed by a, a tax, I think it was 50 cents a year or something like that for people that owned property. And uh, that area was a lot of people, maybe a million people. I think it finally got up to a dollar a year or something like that for every taxpayer. And that was able to finance the salaries of these people and uh, buy a building, <coughs> a rehearsal hall, and a recording studio. But it seemed like something like that could be done a lot of places. Uh, you think you buy a gripe about a dollar a year? Yeah. You might. If you had, um, if you could pick out a record or two that uh, you would want people to identify as one of your best, was there a time or a particular record or recording that, that you're most happy with? Yeah. Uh, I think maybe I played better on other people's records than I played on my own. Mm. I, I'm not sure. But well, there's less to worry about, right? <laughs> yeah, you show up and play. You know, then you're the leader. You got all these headaches, and yeah, people are worried I've about the other guys showing up. <laughs> yeah. And uh, how much money you're costing a record company? Boy, if we go over time, this is going to—I never record with them again. Or all kinds of things. <laughs> when you're the leader, you know that. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, there was a, Tony, a record I did with Tony Bennett a long time ago. I had a couple of spots on it mm. that I, I got into some kind of other frame of mind for a few bars. It was a, something about um, bro, uh, New York, my hometown, or something like that. And he did some kind of eerie songs. Uh, not really, you know, not really eerie, but you know, like Lonesome in the City and that kind of bluesy feel of Manhattan. Uh, and I, I think I made a few wolf calls or something. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in a ballad, you know, where you really got into some kind of... And I, the thing I did with Billie Holiday, I had a couple of nice spots that I felt pretty good about. Uh -huh. The Lady in Satin album. That was, that was all ballads, I think. Tony, the, he did a penthouse serenade, and I played one where I started way out low, like a bass from bone for a while. And it came up better than I thought it would. Mm. Did you ever have an occasion to play or record with Joe Williams? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Tell us I about have, Joe. Yeah, they did some nice ballads with Joe. We had an orchestra with, you know, the strings and, a, and we did some small group things. That was one of the great things about doing the studio work, uh, along with a lot of the garbage that they throw at you. There's, all these wonderful people coming through New York all the time to make records, and uh, I think he did this nice album. Joe Hunter wrote the arrangements. And uh, uh, right shortly after I arrived in New York City, I think in 1954, uh, Buck Clayton was contracted to do these jam session records for Columbia. Uh -huh. And uh, I was called to participate in those. That was right after I had left Woody Herman's band. And got to meet all my old heroes on that 
those records, like Lawrence Brown was there and Truman Young was there. Roy, Roy Eldridge. Well, I had worked with Roy with Gene Krupa's band for a while anyway. But, uh, Is that when you recorded the Coleman Hawkins? Yeah, Coleman oh, Hawkins. Yeah. Wow. That's Buddy quite a Tate. List. A lot of people. Yeah. I got to meet all those people. I got <laughs> to know them. It's wonderful. Yeah. Hang out with Coleman Hawkins. Boy. <laughs> Something. Did you ever have occasion to work with or be influenced in any way by J.J. Johnson? Well, we worked together a lot, but uh, somehow I don't think I... I was pretty strong in my own thinking, I guess, by the time we crossed paths. But we did, he was doing studio work about the same time I was in New York. Then he went to California and maybe came back. But I admired him greatly, you know, what he does is he's just wonderful. He's such a musician. And, uh, such a clean, neat player. What was it like? Uh, didn't you participate in the Benny Goodman story, the film of that? Mm -hmm. Steve Allen played Benny Goodman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that is that? Uh, what's it like to do a film like that? Is it sit around and wait a lot, or? Well. Benny, had, I was working with Benny around New York in some small combo kind of things like at Basin Street West. Teddy Wilson was playing with him at the time, and uh, Paul Quinnishe, Ruby Braff, and uh, he had. Uh, and I just uh, just uh, signed on at CBS uh, as a staff musician there, and uh, and Benny asked me if I'd like to go to California to uh, do the soundtrack for the Benny Goodman story. And I, I really wanted to do it, so I went and uh, got a release from that <laughs> CBS. And I never had a steady job after that. That was a like, steady job, <laughs> ever, which is fine. It, it worked out just the freelancing. Yeah. It worked out a lot better. But so Benny took me and Stan Getz and Buck Clayton and George DeVivier and Gene Krupa, Buck Clayton. Out to, for the soundtrack, and while we were out there, the uh, director of the movie asked us if we'd like to stay on and do the picture also. So we stayed and did the picture. Just another couple of weeks, we just uh, pretended to be playing because we'd already made the, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. the soundtrack. And I didn't realize that Benny was in on the movie too. Well, he was on in the music part of it. Yeah, and he coached. Actually, they. Hired Saul Yeager. Do you know who Saul Yeager is? Just the name. He's a he was a good clarinet player around New York, and he his whole life was dedicated to trying to sound like Benny Goodman, and even trying to look like him. Like oh. he, he did everything he could to look like Benny, and including filing his teeth under a curved shape oh or something. God. And and he had all these actions down where he lift one leg or whatever when he's playing, and and so he coached Steve Allen on how to do all that stuff. <laughs> So, so, that's so the, the the Elvis impersonations are not new. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> a, wow. Benny was funny out there. He, he decided he didn't like the way Gene Krupa played anymore. I think uh, for some reason because uh, he was the star of his early band, you know, Gene. Yeah. And he was trying to get him fired. And I, I would have to be rooming with Gene uh, on the set, like in the dressing room. We shared the same dressing room, and he said, "The old man's trying to get me fired." Uh, but he couldn't fire him because uh, his contract was with the studio, not Benny. So, mm -hmm. did he give him the Ray? I keep hearing about uh, their Ray. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's just a, a myth. That's, that's, that's a myth. He just uh, he might be looking at you, but thinking about something completely. Oh, he's okay. One of, one of those kind of people. Yeah, and you think he, he you think he's like trying to stare you down or something, huh? That's what people thought. I never took it that way. I got I got to know Benny. Mm -hmm. Pretty well. He's the, very nice. The sunny me. listing of musicians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stared at yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, sunny listing. Yeah. Mm. That's great. I have a, a quick story I wanted to ask you. I read about a fellow named uh, Marv Gold. Merv Gold. Merv Gold. From a player around New York. Yeah. Uh -huh. And some practical joke he did with some mouthpiece that he. Oh yeah, well, he, he was up. always doing. Uh, you know, he had a wonderful sense of humor. But he gave me a present of this mouthpiece, trombone mouthpiece. And 
said, uh, I want you to try this as uh, I call it, it's my new Sure Grip mouthpiece. Uh-huh. And uh, the, around the rim of it, you know, where it fits on you, he had made jagged edges all the way around, like like teeth, you know, so Sure Grip. So. <laughs> <laughs> then another time he brought me a necklace of mouthpieces. Like uh -oh. he said, he's always, you know, when he's the guy's, uh -huh. Could never find a mouthpiece that he liked, so he had hundreds of them. He put up, made a whole necklace out and put it around my neck on a recording session one time. Interesting. How do you feel about your uh, your current working band that you have? Well, uh, this will be the second time we played together. We played one night a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> Just uh, we're not very organized. That's jazz. Yeah. Well, that's. <laughs> Uh, that's Sometimes. my favorite kind of music now is when it's not so organized, you uh -huh. know, like a, the, I did that big band thing for, I was on the road for 11 years from one band to another and uh, it's kind of a, a freedom to get out and just play with a little small group where you don't have any real arrangements, mm. we have a, maybe an ending now and then or how to start it, but yeah. <laughs> but that's that's really what I like to do the most now. In fact, I always did, but I always got thrown on the lead trombone chair with all these bands. And uh, some of them, like Woody's band, I was able to play both the lead and the jazz solos and until Carl Fontana came along then we had to share the jazz solos. So. You know, I w we have asked a number of players about the, the etiquette involved in who gets the solos, you know, and does the is it sometimes a point of contention between players, you know, like, how come I'm not getting any? Al Gray talked about being in the Basie <laughs> band for a while, and since he was the new guy, he wasn't getting any, you know, and he, he didn't like uh, it. Well, uh, the leader is the one that's in charge of who plays, you know, mm -hmm. like a... And Gene Krupa's band, when I first joined Gene, he, he, was, he was a guy that thought lead guy should only play the lead, and, and the second guy played all the jazz solos. And, that was, and, when, uh, and then Frank Roslino came on the band, and, and I was, just about that time, I was going to ask Gene, Kent, I'd like to move over to the second chair, let somebody else play the lead, you know. And uh, then Frank Roslino came on, and he was, you know, he's, he's a fantastic player, and so I stayed over there in the league for a while longer. Then finally he left and went with Stan Kenton, and I, and I told Gene, I said, I don't want to play that second chair. I don't want to play lead anymore, you know. Yeah. He said, okay, you can play the second chair if you'll play the lead on the four trombone section thing, uh -huh. just where we have a melody thing for a while. So that's the way I ended up my last year with Gene. And then Woody Herman heard me play, I guess, on that, doing that setup, and then they, when Bill Harris left the band, I took Bill's place. I don't know if you can hear me. I feel like I'm mumbling. No, <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, I was saying to the monk, I, I've been wearing a hearing aid for about the last five years, and yesterday it conked out on me, and uh, so everything sounds a little. It's not a good place now. to have things conk out. <laughs> no, I don't have a terrible problem. It's just like over years of playing with brass in your ears, I guess, and uh, yeah. a lot of the high frequencies have gone, and, yeah. and I like to advise all young musicians to protect your ears a little better than I did over all those years, like put earplugs in if you're in a real noisy situation, and I sat right next to Gene there, and oh. the trumpet's right in back of you all the time, and, and I think it might have had something to do with it. I yeah. guess heredity probably has got something to do right. with it, too. Oh. Just one last question I wanted to ask you is, is jazz alive and healthy in the hands of some of today's young artists? And if so, well, Come hear you... Chris Prada and my son Jesse tonight. Well, you'll find Great. out. Great. <laughs> oh, okay. And we heard Antonio Hart. Oh, Antonio Hart was night. good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's some really terrific young players around. And I think maybe uh, the general public is starting, starting to place jazz into a permanent category, you know. Well, like we're a young country, like most, like all those European countries, they, they've got their folk music that developed, took 100 years to, to get there, I guess, and, and uh, maybe that's what jazz is, it's gonna arrive. It's, so, it's a situation now, I don't know how, what else can they do with it, to, you know? It's, 
really. You tell, like bebop is supposed to be old now, but that's like uh, 50 years old or so, right? And yet it still sounds pretty modern to me. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so maybe that, maybe the that the traditional the bassy uh, rhythm section, and uh, of course when it went a little beyond that too, you know, with a little more freedom. But as long as you got that swing going, like you wear, what you don't mean to think of it ain't got right. <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's, it's got a maybe that's going to become our folk music, you know, <laughs> or the American. Well, they got polkas in, in uh, yeah. Germany and Poland and everything. I don't know. And uh, the Irish had their music. They had some music that sounded very much like jazz to me. Some of those Irish violinists, you know, sound like the Benny Goodman Trio sometimes. You know? The violin, well, fiddle wailing away, you know. I guess that all went kind of down in the bluegrass country and related, but they get to swinging pretty hard there sometimes. That's so a good all point, though. And then the country western music now. They've got what we call a standard rhythm section. Like you've got the drums and the bass and the rhythm player. You know, they sound like swing music of uh, popular swing music of the of the '40s or something, sort of. So they're not doing the same old thing either. But it seems like it's all coming kind of related, right? Or something. I think it's a good point too about our country not not being nearly as old as. At some point, maybe we're still sorting out our priorities as, as far as the arts. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's interesting with jazz history that you can still hear some of the originators of Dixieland, the actual people playing it. You know, and yet you've got the young folks here doing fusion and the whole the whole gamut of music. You can still hear big band and and bop and and everything. And commercials that you hear have got a lot of jazz in them these days. And in fact, I've noticed a lot of the current television sitcoms and things. They have a piano player. I don't know who it is, but some real good jazz player back there playing some nice stuff. That's okay. So it's, it's well, we want to thank Irby Green for being with us today. And uh, this is Green. it's been a real valuable input to our Hamilton Jazz archives. Well, it's my thank pleasure you. to be here, Mom. Right. Thank you. Mike. Take care. All right.